a little bit of an echo. So can you share, do you have a screen to share? Is that what you're gonna do? Uh, yes, let me try okay. to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So, hello, everyone. As you already know me, I'm Uzzol Katri. And today we will be talking about breast cancer, obesity, and anti visive therapy. So, before going into the like actual paper and the topic, I will give you like a brief or like a background on all the terms they are, the paper uses and a little bit like background from our like lecture on, on Monday as well. So first, so brief introduction about breast cancer. I don't think it needs an introduction, but I found this uh, data online that in 2020 there uh, is an estimated 276,480 new cases of invasive breast cancer that will be diagnosed in like women in the US as well as 48,530 new cases of non-invasive breast cancer so this data you know shows like how like serious like the breast breast cancer is not like not just in U USA I have the data for USA but it's throughout the world and here it says like one in eight women in the United States will develop breast cancer in their lifetime so the this website has a lot of like breast cancer facts so if you are interested you can just like visit the website mm -hmm. so some of the terms that uh, the paper discusses about are uh, I'll be discuss few of the I'll discuss few of those and one of them is VASF and uh, we all know that VASF is vascular endothelial growth factor and it is a signaling protein that promotes the growth of new blood vessels and it is involved in vasculogenesis as well as angiogenesis and it also plays a role uh, during embryonic development or after injury or like muscle following exercise or like formation of new vessels to bypass any blocked vessels. And here it shows uh, multiple like many functions of uh, VZF uh, that those include uh, activation of coagulation cascade, angiogenesis, vascular homeostasis, immunomodulation, bone marrow function, thyroid function, blood pressure, kidney function. So VASF is a very important signaling protein in our body. And the other term uh, is IL-6, which stands for interleukin-6, uh, and it is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, which is encoded by the IL-6 gene. And here on the right side, you can see the functions of IL-6 in our body. Like it also has so many functions, like including the regulation of CD4 positive T cells, regulatory T cells, B cells. Or the main topic of this like paper we are going to discuss is angiogenesis by stimulating VASF. Uh, so another one is FGF2, which is fibroblast growth factor 2, and it is also uh, important in embryonic development, cell growth, morphogenesis, tissue repair, and tumor growth and invasion. So FGF2 can itself bind to FGF receptor for its function, or it can also upregulate endothelial cell expression, like cellular expression of VASF as well. So this diagram briefly shows that's my presentation, sorry. So this diagram uh, briefly shows uh, the role of VASF and FCF. Uh, so VASF can independently uh, impact cell survival and proliferation, but FCF2 can also uh, induce VASF for the downstream signaling pathway. Mm -hmm. 
so this slide is from uh, our lecture i just wanted to uh, refresh everyone's memory so because this paper brief basically talks everything about obesity and its relation with other proteins right so obesity is defined by body mass index and uh, we have different classification within uh, even the obesity but mostly if the bmi is greater are uh, equals to 30 then we consider that person as uh, as having ob obesity so uh, diving into breast cancers uh, we uh, briefly discussed this also in our in the lecture on monday but so just giving touching uh, briefly that there are three main parts of a breast which includes lobules uh, that is important in milk milk production ducts that carries milk from the lobules to nipple and then there are connective tissues which contains fibrous and fatty tissues so most of the breast cancer occur in the ducts or the lobules and there are cancer associated adipocytes caas that are pro predominant cell population in the stromal compartment of breast cancers so this uh, slide is also from our lecture, but this is also important because uh, the paper talks about ER positive or triple, triple negative breast cancer. So triple negative breast cancer is that if all of these are especially if ER and HER2 is negative uh, or if they are, it's like estrogen receptor positive, then it is considered as ER positive. Okay, so... Uh, before starting like the paper i just want to say that let's like you know make this presentation or discussion because uh, this paper itself is so huge and you know if i'm confused or if i'm i make some mistake uh, in explaining something or let's just interrupt me and let's have a discussion while like going through the presentation itself so the title of the paper is Obesity Promotes Resistance to anti vasodilator Therapy in Breast Cancer by Upregulating IL-6 and Potentially FGF2. So the, some, these terms we already covered, that that's why now we understand what all these like IL-6, FGF2 or like VASF is so that it will be easier to just follow through the remainder of the presentation. So in the introduction section, the authors emphasize the fact that there have been uh, like drugs in the market uh, approved by FDA. But for uh, here, for example, that there, there is this drug Bevacizumab. So it is anti vasf antibody. And uh, this was like revoked by FDA because it was like it lacked overall survival benefit in phase three trials. And then there was like other instances in available in the like, research field that there was reduced survival in metastatic colon cancer patients with obesity and there were also uh, conflicting reports in metastatic kidney cancer uh, but the authors emphasized the fact that the effect of obesity on anti vasodilator response in breast cancer patients was unknown till the like until that point so they wanted to see the relationship uh, between these different aspects in breast cancer uh, so the uh, the relationship bet between obesity and breast cancer and how it impacts each other. So basically, obesity uh, means like there is a rate of adipose tissue expansion and that which exceeds the rate of angiogenesis. So this results in tissue vascularization and hypoxia. So how hypoxia Im impacts uh, breast cancer is that it... Uh, regulates or like uh, the release of cytokines and chemokines in that within that tumor microenvironment so which causes inflammation and the recruitment of additional pro-inflammatory and pro-angiogenesis mediators so these these were also seen when like uh, VASF was blocked so we can see a relation like briefly in the background that obesity is doing the same thing as when we were blocking VASF so the, uh, for driving the hypothesis, uh, they uh, had this uh, belief that obesity can increase tumor inflammation to, through that like hypoxia condition or like vascularization impact. So the, they hypothesized that obesity promotes resistance to anti vasodilator therapy in breast cancers via systemic as well as local overproduction of inflammatory and alternative angiogenic factors. 
So for their research design, uh, they combined the preclinical -pre studies with a phase two clinical study of breast cancer patients treated with anti of therapy. And uh, in this, uh, I studied already 60 to 70% of breast cancer patients uh, were presented with excess weight. That means, you know, some um, most of them were already in that category with obesity. Uh, and then they found that there was overproduction of IL-6 in tumors with obesity. Uh, so blocking the IL-6 reverted obesity-induced resistance to anti vasoactive therapy in primary and metastatic breast cancer models. And they also like found out that FCF2 was also associated with obesity and it may contribute to resistance to anti vasoactive as well. So this, this was their overall picture to drive the entire research uh, that I will be presenting now. So here on uh, figure one, we, ca we can see that there were like 99 patients with either ER positive or triple negative breast cancer. And uh, day zero is like the, uh, when they like, start, like the, uh, no treatment. And after that, they were treated with uh, Vevakizumab, which is anti vasf for like two weeks. And then they continue treatment with both the anti vasf as well as chemotherapy. And here, like uh, in the original study, they reported that only 16% uh, percent of patients presented with a pathology complete response. That means, you know, the anti vasoactive therapy is also not completely reliable and it didn't cure all of those patients. So on figure 1B, they uh, showed that how they collected uh, the information about uh, uh, the deposition of fat, uh, a, like, and they took visceral adipose tissue VAT and subcutaneous adipose tissue SAT with the help of CT scan. And they quantified that one. Here we can see like 29 patients and 70 patients with a BMI less than 25 uh, or above 25. And here we can see above 25 BMI, there is an increase in breast tumor size compared to like BMI less than 25. So they did the immunohistochemical staining uh, for both low VAT and high VAT before treatment and after at day 14 of anti vasoactive treatment. And here on low VAT, we can see there's, so they stain for CD31, which is an uh, endothelial cell marker, which uh, stains the vessels, I think, yes. So vessel staining is CD31. So here we can see on low VAT at day zero, we can see a lot of CD31 is staining, but at day 41, it reduced. And then, but for high VAT, we can see low CD31 staining to begin with, but still uh, like there is no improvement in the reduction of CD31 marker. And, and also the difference between low VAT and high VAT, we can see here like adipocytes and day 41, like there are more adipocytes like compared to day zero. And then here on figure E and one E and F, they quantified the vessels per area related to like relative to SAT or VAT. So at day zero here with the increase of sat they see that there is a reduction in the vessel area but here at day 14 they don't see like much change in the vessel area so they uh, hy they hypothesized that uh, when like the anti vasoactive therapy is most sensitive in the beginning where there is a low uh, adipose tissue or like uh, less obese then as the SAT increases, then anti vasoactive therapy is less responsive and they are like almost not moving. And so they went ahead and did a check for hypoxia marker, carbonic anhydrase IX, and they, they found that with the increase in uh, VAT, they found that there is an increase in hypoxia marker CAIX for day zero. But then also the same thing that uh, at day 14 after anti-vasive treatment, like uh, in low level of VAT, you can see there is a response. But then even though like there's an increase in VAT, we don't see any change in this, uh, CAIX as well. 
So the conclusion so far is that they found that vascular impairment, uh, uh, which characterizes adipose tissue in obesity, and then on day 14 of the anti-vasive treatment, they found out that vessel densities and hypoxia became independent of patient VAT. So it, they didn't move at all, even though the adipose tissue increased. And then they found that found out that the differences in vessel density in patients with low and high adiposity were reduced after anti-vasive treatment. So it shows that the greater sensitivity was in the low adiposity setting compared to the high adiposity city setting so they were they they will go forward on testing like what or how did it happen that you know with even with the increase in adipose, adipose tissue that like, there is not not much improvement in the uh anti-visive therapy and i just want to interrupt and say you're doing a great job you're exactly right about all their conclusions i just want to say that if you kind of zoom out just as a a lesson to you as you're setting up projects so like now they have these clinical samples that they've made an observation in right and they've come up with a hypothesis that obesity or adiposity is something that's m mitigating or influencing this response to therapy. So the two main things that they're going to do now are they're going to ask the question, what is it, right, about obesity? So that's what you're going to get into next is specifically what is like the mechanism. And then the second thing that they're going to do is they're actually going to model this and ask if they force an obese environment, can that um, – model what they're seeing in the clinical samples, right? So those are kind of two important directions to take big projects, which is why this paper's in science translational medicine. So just something to think about. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So now uh, they, are, they are moving forward by testing, okay, if there is an increase in IL-6, because we said that with obesity, there is uh, overproduction of inflammatory cytokines or pro-angiogenic factors and IL-6 is one of those pro-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, they found out that with increase in VAT, there is an increase in plasma IL-6, both at day 0 and day 14. And also like they related the plasma IL-6 with BMI and here you can see like above as the BMI is higher and higher, the plasma IL-6 also like goes up. And then they did immunohistochemical staining uh, to uh, verify like the IL-6 presence in the tumor region. And here you, we can see uh, IL-6 like brown staining, like it is high in tumor regions, but most specifically near the area of adipocytes. And this is another tumor. And here also we can see that there is a very high staining of IL-6 in the area where adipocytes are already present. So they also uh, try to look for the FCF2 expression, uh, uh, FCF2 expression label in plasma. And here also we can see that the, the both of them are directly proportional. So as the VAT is going up, plasma FCF2 is going up at zero, day zero and day 14 of anti of treatment. So this is just the FCF2 uh, staining of the breast tumor sample. So these are all from the uh, patients. So now like they will move towards build, so, uh, building a model and trying to test uh, actually how obesity is uh, controlling all these overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So the conclusion for figure one is that patients with excess weight present with larger and more hypoxic tumors. And they also found out that there is an increased circulating concentration of both IL-6 pro-inflammatory cytokine and FCF2 pro angiogenic factor. And they found out that the expression of, uh, of those uh, factors are specially localized in close proximity to adipocyte rich regions. So on figure two, so they already have the model now and what they are trying to see is that either like if diet induced obesity reduces the effect of anti vasive therapy on breast cancer progression in mouse models. So they used uh, two models. One is C57 black 6. So this one they used for ER positive, whereas they used C3H mice and they used this for triple negative. 
and they also used two cell lines so E0771 one for ER positive and MCA4 for triple negative and do you understand why they did that? Do no, no, I tried. I tried to Google and look through like each uh, mice model and cell lines, but I could not. But uh, so the one thing I I guessed is that E zero seven seven one they are trying to uh, grow the cancer cell line and inject to C fifty seven black six, so they must be like compatible to each other. Yeah, that's to, exactly right. Yeah. yeah, that's why they've chosen those cell lines because they need to. You know, they're going to, you'll, you'll see later where they get into like what cell types are producing these things and they're going to go into looking at some immune cells. Yes. And so typically what you would have to do when you do a transplant, tumor transplant study, is you have to use immune compromised model, uh -huh. um, right? Like a nude mouse or not skid gamma or something and they don't, their immune systems are screwed up. So yeah, they chose cell lines that are specifically syngenetic to those two mouse strains that are also obesity prone. Yes. yes. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Good. Yeah, they use that that term like syngenic, and I think I googled the meaning. So, yeah. But, okay, so here uh, they saw how how they uh, fed uh, the mice models, and they divided the the uh, diet into high fat diet, which uh, contained sixty percent fat, or a low fat diet, which contained ten percent fat. And they fed the mice from like six weeks of age, and after eight to ten weeks they plant the tumor uh, either like ER positive or triple negative based on the mice model I already mentioned. Then after that when the tumor reached uh, the size of around 100 to 150 millimeter cube then they started the treatment of either with control IgG or anti vsf or control or anti vsf for like both low fa fat diet and high fat diet. Then they collected the tumor, lung collection, for their further experiments. So this one uh, basically shows that after uh, diet initiation we can see that the increase in body weight for like C3H high fat diet and uh, also for C57 high fat diet so this is basically means that with high fat diet the body weight of the mice increased compared to the low fat diet. And uh, I can't remember, do they show, sorry to interrupt you, in there, I can't remember in the supplemental figure, do they ever look at body fat content or just body weight? Uh, I don't remember that because, they do. yeah, I was. So that's also something to be mindful of is yes. body weight is informative about, but calling an animal obese based on its body weight mm -hmm. is a little tricky. Um, and the better way to actually not, uh, like analyze that in rodent models is with body composition analysis. Um, even mice on a high fat diet will gain lean mass. So they'll become like just oh. generally bigger animals and not, and, and fatter, but they'll also get bigger in like bones and, and muscles too. So yes. just a, a note about, you know, merging these two fields. These are cancer people that are doing this study. They're not obesity people. And so, you know, the obesity side of things they could do, I think a little bit better to really characterize their models. But. Yes. I just take the supplemental figures. I, that they don't say like those composition in their supplemental figures. So. Uh, can I ask a quick, a quick yes. question? Yes. I was just curious. I'm not sure. If, maybe I missed it. Do they have um, you know, 077 mouse that has low metabolism? So that way, even though he's on a normal or low fat diet, he just tends to gain weight. Do you know if they, because that would be really interesting if they had a mouse that was prone to have like a metabolic disorder and gain weight regardless of their being fed low fat diet. Uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's, oh. a, that's a good question. But, you know, later in the experiment, when they are trying to show the relation between if it's due to body weight or just the, you know, amount of fat, they will uh, start feeding a high fat diet to the so to some of those low fat diet animals and they will see either like some changes I, I, I don't like really remember but that's what they did just to prove that you know either is it is due to the fat compound fat amount or the body weight I think they have done some experiment like that later yeah they have done that yes yeah 
Yeah. And another option would be like a genetic model of obesity, which would be like an o- the OBOB mouse that I yes. um, talked about would be like one option. As long as it's on the same background as those cells, you could use that as a genetic control. And then on a low fat diet, those animals would still gain weight. So that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So on figure two sheet, they are trying to uh, verify their like cell lines or the tumors that are specific to ER positive or triple negative and here like e0771 is er positive but here there are two terms we need to uh, look for er alpha and er beta so it's the two subunits of estrogen receptor but er alpha is most abundant in mammary like gland and er beta like in mostly like prostate gland or this kind of tissues so uh, the real one we're looking for like for breast cancer er positive or negative is the er alpha and here we can see for two tumors for E0771, they're like it's completely gone, and uh, there is no HER2 or B2, and also for like MCA, MCA4 tumors, it's triple negative, right? So there is no ER alpha. It also wiped out ER beta, and there is no HER2. And for these uh, control cells, here uh, they are so they are showing that. Uh, E0771 cell line. So here we can see no ER alpha on MCF7. It's a positive control for ER. So here we can see ER alpha present, also ER beta. And BT474 is the positive control for the triple negative. And here we can see all of them are present. And they use tubulin as their loading control. Yeah, and so that's a really great catch on the on the ER isoforms. Yes. Um, the, I come from like the kind of hardcore steroid receptor community from Colorado yes. and they do not consider e, uh, EO771s to be ER positive because they're not ER alpha positive. So this is something that you'll see in the literature is that some people, some 10% or 15% of people will claim that these are ER positive cells, mm-hmm. but the, the true sort of steroid receptor biologists are like, no, they're not because ER alpha is the predominant isoform in the breast. And so that's the one that is not present in these cells. So yeah. I've seen, you know, arguments break out. They got away <laughs> with it in this paper because this is a, it's a great paper, yes. but it would, it is a little bit of a stretch for them to draw the conclusion that, that this is a mechanism that's relevant to ER positive breast cancer. Mm. Just yes. saying. So yes. great catch on that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, on this one, like on supplementary figure five, they are just comparing the tumor volume after 10 days of treatment and here we can see uh, other t- t- 10 days of the diet and here we can see obese their tumor volume is 50% larger and they say like compared to like 100 versus 150 between lean and obese so on this figure now they are trying to see uh, how the tumor volume increased after the treatment so here we can see they used b20 so b20 is also anti vasf and here we can see the lean control and lean b20 treated with anti vasf we can see that there is a reduction in the tumor volume and the same here we can see for obese control and b20 treated it also goes down but uh, you know it's not that much difference or that as large difference as in lean control and b20 treated okay and on figure e so the, this uh, figure 2d is for e0771 tumor model and uh, figure e is for mca4 tumor model and but on all of those cases we can we can see that uh, there is a reduction but here one catch is that with the lean control and obese control uh, it's almost like similar tumor volume Sorry, I'm trying to hide the video panel because it's blocking like everywhere. Okay. So on figure, 
supplemental figure supplemental figure eight they are uh, checking the tumor progression influenced by body weight but not diet so here uh, as I already mentioned they took three of those low fat diet uh, uh, feeded like fed mice and they fed high fat diet to those mice and here we, we can see, uh, see that still uh, tumor volume is not that that difference here on like E0771 when they were fed low fat diet to high fat diet and also for like MCA4 we, we don't do not see any significant difference so uh, they are saying that it's uh, influenced by body weight but not diet you know either they are fed low fat diet or high fat diet Uh, so the overall conclusion for figure 2 is that anti vasodilator therapy is less effective in inhibiting uh, breast cancer progression in obese mice. So then they move on to figure 3 where now they want to determine why uh, the anti vasodilator therapy failed to control tumors from obese animals to the same extent as in lean, lean animals. So they start to look for like uh, so here the, when they use the anti vasodilator therapy here like this was the immunohistochemical standing for again CD31 and uh, on lean after the treatment we can see a significant reduction uh, but for obese like it's less to begin with but then uh, af even after treatment like there is uh, not uh, much reduction and they quantified that and for lean it's almost like 80% reduction after B20 treatment but obese they had like less vessel density to begin with that compared to lean but the, there was only like 60% reduction reduction in the uh, vessel density CD31 density in that tumor So they also uh, looked for CA9 density in those tumor areas. So this is one of the hypoxia marker. And compared to lean and lean B20, here uh, we can see that with B20 treatment, there is an increase in CAIX density. And also uh, from obese to B20, there is like not a significant uh, increase in the CAIX density. So what they did is that they now looked for different cell proliferation and survival markers like phospho-ARC, phospho-AKT, phospho-S6 and here uh, they found out that in lean after the treatment uh, there is a reduction in those markers uh, but here in obese even after the treatment we can still see that the cancer cells are surviving or these survival pathways are like still active active that's why you know maybe we do we are not seeing that much reduction in the tumor volume so they also uh, looked for another hypoxia marker GLUT1 uh, on those and here we can see that between lean and obese there in obese there is a significant increase in the amount of hypoxia marker and uh, so they also did the messenger RNA expression quantification and we can see that it's uh, there is a huge significant difference between the lean and obese for hypoxia marker GLUT1 expression. So uh, what they are saying is that the adipocyte rich and hypoxic tumor microenvironment in obese mice is associated with reduced response to anti vasodilator therapy. So that's what they did. Uh, they are they will see, uh, check now and uh, here uh, it shows the HNE stain and first the most visible thing is the amount of adipocytes between uh, lean and obese tumors and here a lot of adipocytes are, are, there, are there and he, we can see so on the, here like on this figure in the middle we can see that the adipocyte reach region is very high in like ob obese tumor and when they quantified it, the adipocyte di diameter, so the size of adipocytes was also like uh, very huge like compared to the lean uh, adipocyte tumor size. So uh, on supplemental figure 11, they also uh, mentioned that they 
identified other markers so these uh, all these markers are for like adipocytes presence in the tumor and uh, they stand for like perilipin oil red red o caviolin and fast so these are all like marker for cancer associated adipocytes and these are for like ob obese mice we can see like all of them are present yeah so those like what you when you look at an hd and you just see white circles right yes. like in the middle yes. of the tumor it could be like probably those are adipocytes but the dot the prevailing i guess dogma is that it that the tumor doesn't have fat t cells in it right because oh. it's an epithelial tumor so probably yes. what happened i'm guessing yes they were asked to go back and set and prove that those are actually different sites, right? So they did, mm -hmm. they did a good job. They stained with several different things, like oh. you said, service markers and the oil right now is obviously like a lipid dye that actually gets into the lipid. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Excuse me. So now he, here they are uh, now looking for like, those adipocyte poor area versus adipocyte rich area and how the expression of CD31 uh, differs between those. And they found out that the CD31 uh, density is very low compared to adipocyte poor to adipocyte rich. And here like on figure 4D we can see this uh, now stand for hypoxia marker CAIX. And we can see in the adipocyte rich area, there are like a very high expression of those hypoxia markers. And on the adipocyte poor area, like relatively, there is a very low expression of uh, CAIX. And they also uh, did HNE, HNE again. And here we can see the number of mitosis happening uh, in the uh, so this just means like adipocyte rich area there are still a lot of like cell division going on like compared to the adipocyte poor area and that they are showing by these arrows that the region of mitosis but here they quantified quantified so I, 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 I'm not very good at looking at those slides so I don't know how it is a mitosis in this area. That's like a skill that takes yeah. years like, to develop that skill but yeah they're claiming those are mitotic foci right like yeah. cells that are dividing. Um, yes. pathologists can look and they're like, they can just tell you it's amazing mm -hmm. what they can see. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, but the, from the quantification, they, uh, they have shown that there is, uh, an increase in the uh, number of, uh, mitosis, uh, in adipocyte rich area compared to the poor area. And on figure four F now they quantified, uh, here like KI 67, which is also a marker of cell proliferation. And we can see that the staining is high in adipocyte rich area. So uh, this is saying that, you know, in adipocyte rich area, we have hypoxia, but still the cells are surviving. The cells are growing more than compared to adipocyte poor area. So what, is there any role adipocyte, these adipocytes are playing for cell proliferation and growth? So that this, this is where we are, you know, going towards. Yeah, and so from your previous slide, you know, they showed CD31 was yes. actually lower yes. in the adipocyte-rich area, right? So yes. then if you think about the, the purpose of the anti-VEGF therapies is to inhibit basically the cells that express CD31. Yes. But it obviously doesn't matter in obesity because they already don't have that much anyway. Mm -hmm. And the adipocytes aren't necessarily promoting new vessel formation. They're just providing factors, right, that are going ahead and stimulating proliferation probably, yes. you know, through those other hallmarks. Yes. If you think about the hallmarks of cancer. So yeah, that's really interesting. Yes. Okay. So on figure four, so here, uh, they, um, look for another factor like necrosis in the area where there are uh, less adipocytes compared to areas where there are high number of adipocytes and what they found uh, was that there is a high necrosis in the area where there are less number of adipocytes whereas like where, where there are a high number of adipocytes the cells are like still proliferating and they are viable and they quantified this uh, data and found out that in adipocyte rich areas the percentage of necrotic tissue is like significantly different you know compared to the adipocyte poor areas. So now we can like uh, look more into yes, you know, adipocytes are playing some role, you know, despite of anti therapy. 
So the conclusion for figure 4 is that the adipocyte rich and hypoxic tumor, tumor microenvironment in obese mice is associated with reduced response to anti VSF therapy. So now on figure 5, they want to look at those uh, uh, cancer associated adipocytes that are uh, associated with increased production of uh, pro-angiogenic growth factors and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we discussed, right, there must be something those adipocytes uh, are doing for this uh, cancer cell growth. So now they will look for those pro-angiogenic growth factor and pro-inflammatory cytokines and how they sustain angiogenesis and tumor pro progression even we are blocking uh, VASF signaling. So here on figure 5, they uh, did a uh, scan or messenger exp express messenger RNA expression analysis for all these uh, different pro-inflammatory cytokines and between uh, compared to like lean and obese with like a of treatment we can see a high production of IL-6 in uh, almost all of all of them like so here we can see IL-6 and here they quantified the IL-6 uh, expression in the tumor uh, in the obese Treated with B20, we can see that there is an increase in IL-6 expression. Uh, so they also stained uh, for IL-6 in those tumor and they found out that IL-6 is localized in the area where uh, adipocytes are present. And they what uh, they are saying is that these IL-6 are uh, produced by uh, the adipocytes and myeloid cells present in that tumor. So uh, here I can uh, they did the double staining. Now we already know that GLUT1 is one of the hypoxia marker. So here we can see GLUT1 expression in the adipocytes, IL-6 expression rate uh, in the adipocytes. And when we merge them together, we can see that uh, both of them are co-localized within those adipocytes area. And here on figure 5e, they also stained for IL-6 and CD11B which uh, stands for like infiltrating myeloid cells and so they also found out that both of them are co-localized in the same area where adipocytes are present. Also they stand on figure 5F for IL-6 and uh, particularly F4 uh, AD macrophages and they also found out that uh, those are also co-localized in the same area in the adipocytes rich region. So the, they also stained another one like carbonic anhydrase X. This is also another hypoxia marker, and they also found out that uh, the this hypoxia marker is uh, like co-localized with the macrophages. So what they are saying is that IL-6 is being produced by those adipocytes, but specifically like myeloid cells and the F4 AT macrophages. Uh, so uh, how can we uh, make sure that okay IL-6 is being produced yeah, if IL-6 is the one which is like uh, dictating all the cell proliferation so what they looked at was the IL-6 receptor expression and then GP-130 expression so GP-130 is the uh, signal transducing subunit of IL-6 so there is a like, high expression of uh, IL-6 receptor and GP-130 in those cell lines so that means IL-6 is acting directly to those cells via these receptors for the cell proliferation and growth in those tumors. Then they also looked for a phosphostat 3 expression in those adipocytes. So this is also one of the downstream signaling pathway that is responsible for cancer cell growth and survival. So the conclusion for uh, this figure 5 is that they revealed the cellular sources of IL-6 to be adipocytes and infiltrating CD11 B positive myeloid cells in particular like F4 AD positive macrophages. And this is consistent with the predominance of IL-6 in hypoxic adipocyte rich areas. Macrophage infiltration was also more prevalent in these areas. So what they con conclude from this is that IL-6 might be a rational target to overcome obesity induced resistance to anti of therapy. Okay, so now they are saying IL if we block IL-6 and still give anti therapy, the response with the tumor should be 
like working so now they will look that in figure six that if we block IL-6 if it overcomes resistance to anti vasotherapy in obese mice so here now we treat um, the those obese and lean mice with B20 anti vasotherapy like uh, or B20 plus IL-6 inhibitor and here we can see that compared to the controls there is a significant reduction in the tumor volume so for example obese control is this one so when we treat them with obese plus B20 anti VSF, uh, it significantly lowers the tumor volume to here but then when we add uh, IL-6 inhibitor with the B20 we can see like it reduced but not a lot but it's, it still reduced uh, tumor volume by some amount but then in lean mice we can see the, with the B20 treatment it is more like reduction in tumor volume but then when we added IL-6 inhibitor there is uh, not much change in the tumor volume so what they concluded is that later uh, IL-6 uh, adding IL-6 with the anti-VGF is beneficial especially, especially in like obese setting because in obese setting due to those adipocytes this is happening so they don't see any difference in lean b20 plus il6 inhibitor in this like, graph on those mice so they also looked for uh, a metastasis in the lung tumor here so in the in the lung tissue and what they found out that uh, from the from the quantification that for the obese mice there is much less like metastasis when uh, we treated them with B20 plus IL-6 inhibitor but still like we don't see that much difference uh, in the metastasis in lean mice so on figure uh, supplemental figure 15 they are now saying uh, so what they did now is that they completely like knocked out IL-6 uh, IL-6 and they try to see the difference in the tumor like IL-6 concentration present, uh, present in those like models so what they found out was that there was a 75 reduction in IL-6 concentration so between the IS, so obese B20 treatment to the IL-6 inhibitor we can see a difference but when we uh, treated it's not a lot of reduction but it's still like some reduction but it's not significant enough that you know even we like uh, pharmacologically inhibited or like genetically inhibited IL-6 like it's still around the same level so here now like they're trying to prove a point like what's the difference between pharmacological inhibition or genetic inhibition of IL-6 and how it is playing role so what they are showing here is that now they genetically like removed locked out IL-6 and the tumor volume is here and when they added IL-6 inhibitor it's here it's not significant you know in both whatever like doing both ways and now like here compared to the uh, obese control we can see like obese uh, IL-6 uh, knockout is like higher tumor volume and also like using IL-6 inhibitor is lower but it's not significant enough but so here like they are trying to prove the point that IL-6 plays an important role in tumor progression but only in the context of obesity and VEGF blockade so without so if, if we don't like combine B20 and IL-6 inhibitor then still just using one of them like individually doesn't have much impact in the reduction of tumor volume okay so on figure 6 C and uh, C the they quantify the Ki67 cell proliferation marker between those like B20 treated or B20 plus IL-6 inhibitor treated on the lean here we can see there is not much difference in the Ki67 density but on obese B20 here we can see a huge reduction after we added IL-6 inhibitor and also they looked for uh, like uh, different X uh, cell proliferation markers uh, in the downstream signaling pathways so here uh, on the B20 lean and B20 uh, plus IL-6 inhibitor we don't see like there is a slight reduction but it's already reduced when we used anti vsf therapy so and but it reduced like p38 which is a part of map kinase pathway it reduced on some tumors but still like some tumors like 
nothing like it did nothing but here compared to like this to obese b20 and il6 inhibitor we can see small like slight reduction on those like pathway but not uh, a significant reduction uh, in all of these pathways So here now like they are trying to look for the CD31 positive area between those like obese uh, B20 and IL6 inhibitor plus B20, and now we can see we can see that ob like obese and B20 there is not much difference. But when we treated them with uh, IL6 inhibitor, like it, the vessel density, so what this lectin they did the perfusion. So I I was like little like confused on this one uh, for the purpose so I think that like, lectin goes into the vessels or the tumor and they look for the perfusion so and so the main aim of this uh, experiment was to see the functional uh, uh, vessel density uh, in those tumors but what they found out was after inhibiting IL-6 with B20 there are like increased number of functional vessel density in those like tumors and here we can see uh, the expression of uh, CAIX. Now the hypoxia marker reduced. That that means so that these both like go hand in hand. Now we have functional vessel den density uh, going up. That means uh, the oxygen is like reaching those areas. So now we have like less hypoxia in those regions. So these are for obese mice. So and what they said is that uh, they did not uh, see any effects like in line lean mice as we already observed uh, with the difference between B20 and IL-6 inhibitor combined. So the main conclusion of Figure 6 was that IL-6 upregulation contributes to resistance to anti-vasive in obesity. So by by sustaining tumor cell proliferation, reducing perfusion with associated aberrant hypoxic microenvironment and promoting chemokine and immune cell recruitment so uh, can I ask a question so what does this like perfusion experiment uh, is like uh, like why like how does it work and you know what is this oh, I've never done it but um, I it's they're looking at functional vessel yes. density right so yes. that's like you have CD31 staining and you can look at the CD31 and sometimes you can see that it's like a vessel cross section but sometimes it's just like depending on where you section the tumor maybe you just have like a little strip of cd31 positivity so i'm assuming what they're looking at here is is there an actual um like it, is there evidence that those vessels are actually intact vessels and stuff mm. is getting into them yeah. this figure actually confuses me a little bit too because i thought kind of their whole thing up front was that it wasn't the angiogenesis that was really impacted it was mm -hmm. like the adipocytes that were in there doing other things yeah. so when I taught when I think it out okay so you have adipocytes those are producing IL-6 yes. so you don't have a ton of CD31 positive vessels so then if you block IL-6 you get more CD31 positive vessels but then wouldn't that be so I guess that's what they're saying that restores the the um that restores the sensitivity to the VEGF inhibitors, mm. I guess. Yes. Right? So yes. then at that point, there's something to block yes. with the VEGF yes. inhibitors. Maybe yes. that's what they're saying. Yes. But yeah, I've never done this particular assay, but I think probably what you do is like perfuse the animal. Yeah. And the le the lectin can be like fluorescent or, you know, you can actually buy lectin that's, you can see in the vessel. So you perfuse the animal and it goes like throughout their whole body. Oh. And then you just section the tumor and look for, so they would probably stain and then also Im image for the labeled lectin and ask, is it physically going through those vessels and are those actual intact functional vessels? And then the um, hypoxia marker is like a tumor specific readout of yes. whether or not that vessel has been able to bring, like you said, oxygen. Yes. You know? Yes. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, we looked at how like IL-6 uh, uh, affects the tumor area. So on figure seven, they want to see uh, in the absence of IL-6 upregulation, how like if FGF2 plays similar role to provide like resistance to anti therapy in, in obesity. 
So for this, they used their second uh, breast tumor model, which is triple negative MCA4 tumors. And here, first, uh, what they did is the again scanning for the messenger RNA expression level. And here we can see a high, a very high expression of FGF2. Uh, but IL6, there is uh, not like much difference. But here they introduce another drug. Uh, metformin. So what metformin uh, does is that it uh, helps in reducing the amount of FGF2 expression. So it's just like inhibitor of FGF2. So, so real quick, this is just so you just this is where things kind of get like confusing. Okay. I think for most people that read this paper only a couple times, this to me is like a totally separate story. Yes. I almost feel like what happened is they had these two probably students or postdocs working on these two projects. Uh. And like the IL-6 one turned out a lot better and more developed. And the FGF2 one was like sort of in some models, FGF2 was important. And so they just put them together. But the relevance of that is kind of what I talked about in the lecture where the obese situation impacts everything, right? Yes. Like your immune yes. cells, your adipocytes, your stromal cells, all of the aspects of your tumor microenvironment. So it's reasonable to think that in the context of obesity in women with breast cancer, there isn't going to be just one explanation for mm -hmm. why treatments fail, right? Yes. So this is this is just showing you kind of the diversity that obesity can provide in terms of options for a tumor to ignore therapy. Yeah, basically. Yes. And then metformin is basically it's it. They're claiming it reduces expression of FGF2, and it does. Metformin is basically an anti-diabetic drug. Yeah, that's yes, yeah. I read about that, but yeah, I was wondering how it reduces FGF2. And then the way how metformin works, yeah. it's been around for decades and it's, people are like, oh, AMP kinase. And there's a, there's a hashtag on Twitter that's like metformin mechanism watch. Oh, okay. So every time there's a new paper that comes out with something else that metformin does, it's just, it's kind of a joke, but <laughs> metformin is very effective for a lot of things. We just yes. don't exactly know how. So it's like, okay, it turns out it reduces FGF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. And I think the way they said that, you know, FGF2 is also like upregulated. They, I think, you know, they found, found out by like some miracle or something, you know, they were looking for IL-6, but some mice FGF2 was, uh, you know, overexpressed. So they yeah. just wanted to see more about that. So, you know, in the introduction. And even on the title, they say, you know, maybe FCF2 as well. You know, I know. It's so funny how you go back and you're like, I totally hypothesized that maybe <laughs> FGF2 was possibly potentially important. Yeah. They did not do that. And I have some take home messages for you guys, some lessons when you're, when we're done about, about how to do your studies. One of them involves do those global screens. You cannot put an, in an NIH grant to do like a screen of all the blood, right? Like, or of everything that could be possible. They want you to have a hypothesis, uh -huh. but never turn away from doing a global screen because you might not know, right, what you're going to get. And yeah. those big discovery-based approaches like sequencing or proteomics or whatever, you can learn a lot. Obviously, that's what they did in some way, shape, or form for the study. And they were like, oh, FGF2. And so they went, you know, they reverse <laughs> hypothesized, which yes. is very common. But yeah, that's, you're right. I think it's, this is something that was not part of the original plan, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be pretty interesting. Yes. Okay. So moving forward on 7B, so they quantified for the level of IL-6 expression on those uh, new mice model. So here they don't see a significant reduction or increase, increase in IL-6, but here on the FGF2 expression label, they, they see that after treating treating with like B20 anti-FGF, it significantly went, uh, went up. And after you adding like metformin to it, it came back down like even lower than the, the B20 or even with the lean B20 treatment. So this is a supplemental figure 24 where uh, they looked at uh, different uh, inflammatory and angiogenic markers and they are, they are also trying to say that they did not uh, really uh, see any significant difference like increase or decrease in other like inflammatory and angiogenic markers in these MCA4 tumors but FGF2 was the one they found out like significantly in, uh, increased on those mice models. So they just wanted to confirm that I think you know it's just FGF2. Okay, so now on uh, figure 7C, uh, they are trying to see uh, the localization of FGF2 on those tumors. 
so what they are saying is that SGF2 is also uh, expressed by adipocytes or the, in the area where adipocytes are, are rich. So, and they also stand for SMA. So what SMA means is the smooth muscle actin and which is stand for like fibroblast. And what they are saying is that FGF2 is expressed by adipocytes as well as fibroblasts that are present in that area of, uh, where adipocytes are rich. On figure 7D, now uh, they compared the CD31 density, again uh, looking at the vessels. And here we can see that uh, compared to lean, uh, lean B20 treated, the vessel density went down. And for obese, compared to obese B20, uh, the CD31 density went up. But the, the uh, interesting thing they are trying to like uh, say here is that obesity rendered B20 ineffective in reducing vessel density uh, compared to lean mice because we expected the vessel density in the tumor to go down because we're trying to kill the, kill the cells. But here like B20 rendered like it, it did not prove beneficial in obese. And the, what they are saying is that the MCA4 tumors were also like less vascularized and more hypoxic. So they did the staining for like CAIX. I think I did not uh, include that supplemental figure, uh, but th th that's what they did to show that they are more hypoxic. So now they want to like move forward and uh, investigate the role of FGF2 on anti-vasive therapy. So if yeah, we uh, block FGF2 if we can get any like tumor uh, volume reduction. So here on figure 7e, so now they are using both like anti-FGFR as well as anti-VASF. Uh, so here let's see like for obese we can see uh, like for control it's right here and then for obese anti-FGFR it came way over here already so it's it's a huge reduction already with anti-FGFR and with obese just like anti-VGF we can see like you know so that this shows that obese anti-FGFR is like really beneficial compared to just like anti-VGF but then they combined combined both B20 and FGFR then it went like again low so this proved that you know if we are blocking FGFR alone or like using both anti-VGF and FGFR then we saw a significant reduction in the tumor volume and then for uh, let's look uh, for lean so lean control uh, we have the tumor volume around here and uh, once we treated with lean anti-FGFR it came down here and with lean B20 alone it's here and lean B20 plus anti-FGFR is here so here I think they're saying like B20 alone was better than just the anti-FGFR but when they like used both B20 and anti-FGFR it is like better than other treatment but still like not a very significant difference between like uh, just the anti-FGFR and anti-FGFR plus B20 and on figure 7F now they are looking again for like different cell signaling like cell proliferation markers and uh, just the obese B20 treatment uh, and obese B20 plus metformin. So B20 treatment here we on like phosphor is so it reduced because we are blocking FGF2 now. The so B20 anti-VGF and now we are blocking FGF2. It went down for phosphor star three. It also went down, but like not ev everything went down. But so phosphor FGFR is gone down because we are blocking like FGF2, but also like not significantly because it's already low on B20. So and phosphor S6, I don't I don't know what pathway is this one, but and then the AMP, I think right mTOR pathway MTOR? right yeah, six kind. Oh okay. So yeah, I think yeah yeah, and the interesting thing they mentioned here is that if with metformin treat, treatment like they saw AMPK uh, pathway going up so this is also downstream of AMPK so what they are suggesting is that FGF2 is indeed playing a role in like cell proliferation that's, that's what they are trying to show here yeah so the AMP kinase activation signal yes. normally happens when you have high levels of AMP 
and low levels of ATP. Okay. And so what that tells your cells is, okay, we're, we got to stop spending energy because we don't have, we have more AMP and less ATP oh. and they want it to be the other way. So when you get that ratio to be like that, um, it'll activate AMP kinase and then AMP kinase kind of sends signals to a bunch of things that says stop spending money, basically like stop spending oh. ATP because okay. we need to make more. So AMP, so it's a marker of metformin response and then it phosphorylates ACC, which is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase is a fatty acid synthesis enzyme, okay. costs a ton of ATP to use. And so when you phosphorylate it, it becomes inactive. So it's basically the cell's way of like, you know, pulling in the belt and like just yes. calming down and not doing much until it gets more energy, basically. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So now here they are looking for like CD31, uh, basal, basal density uh, with uh, like just the B20 and plus like metformin. And uh, we can see here like compared to lean B20 and obese B20, so like we can see after adding metformin, we can see a reduction in the CD31 staining. That means the vessel density reduced after adding metformin in those tumors. So they quantified the CD31 density in the in those tumors, and they found out that after adding metformin to those like obese B20. Uh, tumor models like it significantly went down and even went uh, down the, then the lean B20 after adding uh, blocking like FCF2 and here now they are uh, showing the tumor volume change after like adding metformin so again like no, not much change between lean B20 and uh, significant reduction in the tumor volume so that's why like they are suggesting that this is in the obese condition that FGF2 is uh, overexpressed and if we block it then we can get the tumor volume like going down. So the conclusion for figure 7 is that in the absence of obesity promoted IL-6 upregulation as seen in the other model like FGF2 may mediate resistance to anti therapy in the obese setting by sustaining angiogenesis. So the, this is uh, the last figure they have it, so which kind of like summarizes uh, everything uh, the paper uh, has. So uh, they start with like lean, uh, lean and the obese setting. And then we can see that in the lean setting, we have well vascularized uh, low levels of IL-6 and FGF2. But when like uh, it starts the condition starts to go towards more obese higher BMI then there is a reduced vascularization why because now more adipocytes means like you know the center it's I think center like more hypoxic and then what it does is that this increase in IL-6 and FJF2 so now we have a cancer tumor in that area so then there is still like more increase in IL-6 and FJF2 and the cancer cells are growing with the help of those adipocytes and when we treat them with uh, anti-vasive treatment one thing is that they will be resistant and the other thing we are now we will try to bl block either IL-6 or FGF2 they might be sensitive to anti-vasive treatment and that's what the paper basically showed if we block IL-6 and FGF2 together with um, the anti of treatment, then we will get the tumor cells to be sensitive for anti of treatment. And here uh, on the lower figure, they are showing uh, the mechanism of, of resistance to anti -vasive. So for IL-6, we already talked about like myeloid uh, cells being coming into play, adipocytes, macrophage all together working to stimulate IL-6 and it's like uh, upregulating up those like cell proliferation markers for like cell growth even though we are using anti vasf and for FGF2 we are we are we showed that the role of like adipocytes again and um, how we can like it is playing a role in angiogenesis promoting that like a vessel density base basal formation in even in the absence of anti vasf like vasf so i don't think i i, I don't think i have to go over this because it's just like says the same thing and whatever we discussed up to this point and then uh, 
moving on to the discussion section uh, they now like we can conclude that obesity is associated with hypovascularized and hypoxic tumor at diagnosis and which helps in like uh, an accelerated tumor growth so this uh, when treated like with anti-vasive therapy it uh, provides like resistance in breast cancer because of the secretion of IL-6 or FCF2 from these hypoxic adipocyte region uh, rich region to, uh, in tumors and we also like observe uh, there is an increased tumor cell proliferation in these adipocyte rich regions uh, which remained viable despite like an anti-vasive therapy and whereas the adipocyte pore areas tended to be necrotic so also like uh, under obese conditions tumors grow in and adapt to the hypoxic microenvironment because of the adipose tissue and how they like proved was that the upregulation of hypoxia adapt adaptation factors such as carbonic anhydrase 9 and glut 1 and they also said that the expression of IL-6 or like FCF2 in adipocytes myeloid cells including macrophages and fibroblasts preferential, preferentially in adipocyte rich regions one thing just came to my mind uh, you know maybe they could have just checked FGF2 expression in those like ILC enriched did they do any experiments I w I'm, I'm confused now did they look for like FGF2 for the IL-6 enriched I think they did they must have uh, you're saying did they look for both of them in yeah. the same thing yes um probably I, I thought they did didn't they stain both no they, should have they showed that they were both in the adipocyte rich regions but yeah. I don't know that they stained a single section for both at the same time Is yeah that what that's, that's what came just in my i mind. don't know that they did but you know i wouldn't be surprised because fgf2 is not like did they look in the first model for fgf2 or did yeah, they that's what yeah uh, it was did they look at it um, like um that yeah this this bar graph in figure five i don't oh they did and did it they? wasn't up okay so they're saying so that was the C57s. And you know what's funny is I've actually done a study. In my study that I published the same time they published theirs, they got theirs out first. Mm -hmm. I, I published, I used C57s, and um, I found FGF1 to be different, but not FGF2 in my obese versus lean. So that's really interesting. That's that's very mouse strain specific, I guess, because yeah. IL-6 is high, but FGF2 wasn't. And then in the C3Hs, FGF2 was high and IL-6 really wasn't. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, I think we had, like, one paper discussion about the reproducibility, you know. So, it just, like, raises that question. If we just try to reproduce the same results, will we be able to get it, you know? So. Well, and that's why I was so annoyed that they were like, oh, your paper is <laughs> not important anymore because somebody just showed this thing one time. And I was like, all we hear about is reproducibility. Yeah. So, how come now it's bad right and it's yes. not my paper wasn't even exactly the same like I said it was FGF1 not two and yes. I even have a figure in my paper that's like we looked at two and it wasn't different um so yeah very interesting go ahead I'll let you finish and then I'll tell you guys my okay one one more little quick soapbox and then I'll let you go <laughs> okay Okay, so uh, they also concluded that the adipocytes located near tumor cells upregulated IL-6 production and the cancer associated Adipocytes seem to be the major contributor for the increased IL-6 in tumors from obese mice. So the conclusion basically is that IL-6 blockade may prevent the effects of obesity on cell proliferation, vascular dysfunction, immune cell recruitment, and immunosuppression. And then uh, the other conclusion is like for FGF2 that if like metformin is particularly effective in the obese setting and likely acts via multiple mechanisms. So it's like even they are like it might act likely. So, you know, it's not a concrete conclusion as IL-6 they are providing in their conclusion. Metformin does all kinds of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay. So do you guys have any questions for me? I do. Um, so the first one is um, when they mean the cell proliferation, it, I know it's adipose tissue, is it the activation of dormant pre-adipose uh, cells like Dr. Welberg spoke about on uh, Monday? And if it is, are there specific markers 
that would say that pre-edibocytic cells are um, being activated? Is that the IL-6? Or are these um, adipocytes that are so large that now they're starting to differentiate or um, go through mitosis and, and create more adipocytes? So uh, in the paper itself, like they don't really go into uh, the development of adipocytes itself. So I'm not quite sure because I, I don't know much about this topic as well. But, uh, you know, what they are saying is that the adipocytes already present there and growing there, they are stimulating like other cells as well to produce all these IL-6 or from like fibroblast FCF2. So are you talking, what figure are you referring to? If you just tell me real quick, I'm trying to. Are you talking about? Um, I think she's asking in general if the pre adipocytes. Well, but they they kind of talked about it a little bit in Figure Five, maybe, just by what he was presenting, where they said IL six increased as a result of uh, um, more apop. Sorry, more uh, adipocytes forming. Okay. Yes. So, okay, I can, I mean, I can comment on that a little bit. So in five and six, it looks like they talk about, is it five also? They had the mitosis, the mitotic in, index. Yes. So in that figure, they're looking at the cancer cells proliferating specifically. Um, so what they're showing in figure four, yeah, right here. Yes. So if you look in the, the uh, square with the adipocytes, like the, where it says adipocyte rich area, they're pointing to mitotic cells that are near the adipocyte. So that would be the cancer cells. And it's, I think they're trying to make the case that those, the epithelial cancer cells are the ones that are proliferating that are near the adipocyte. Mm. Um, so, and then, cause like the whole, so then if you look at F, that's the whole tumor and the KI 67 cells within that adipocyte rich area, I would predict are the cancer cells. Um, Mature adipocytes, once they get big, they, they are post-mitotic. They don't uh, proliferate. They'll just die, um, and then there will be a new one. So it could be that there's some fibroblasts in there that are proliferating and expanding um, to create more adipocytes, and that would be really interesting to look at. Um, there are markers that you can stain uh, for, for pre-adipocytes. Like one of them is PDGR, PDGRF, FR. P D G G F R alpha. Um, I don't know what the PD part stands for. Something kind of a growth factor. Literally it's right. but it's a marker of like it's actually a marker of a progenitor cell. Um, so that would be something to test. I'm thinking that what they're for sure in the H and E in E, those are the cancer cells that they're identifying as mitotic. Um, and then in the immunofluorescence, I guess it could be, yeah, it could be, uh, cancer cells or it could be fibroblasts, um, or it's probably not the mature adipocytes though that are proliferating at that point. They typically don't proliferate. So let me check real quick while we are discussing. And then my second question was kind of like a conceptual question. Um, if these tumor cells are... Um, proliferating, growing near the adipocytes. I'm just really curious that why do not um, the newly vascularized or newly forming vascular tissue doesn't form um, like atheromas or um, like atherosclerosis because of the high content of fat that's there, LDL and everything else that's happening that you would see in an individual who has heart disease. Um, and essentially block blood flow to the tumor because um, to me it appears that there is a lot of this, um, you know, the same kind of conditions you would see. In, lipid, yeah, lipid dyslip, dyslipidemia kind of. Exactly. I think. Uh, yeah. I great. I have a I have a thought because you are uh, talking about the you know start of cancer you know, from the beginning, but here, like in this paper, like mostly it's like you already have cancer in the breast. And, you know, if you are like some, like if the patient is with obesity, then those adipocytes are playing a role. You know, it's not like just because adipocytes are there, you are starting to develop cancer, you know, out of nowhere. I don't think it's like that. So 
because if you think like that you know if a person is getting fat and there are a lot of adipocytes then the cells near I, I, yeah of course there will be inflammation of that might ultimately lead to cancer but it's it won't be like oh there are adipocytes a lot of fat fatty tissues there there will be cancer right away i think it's that you already have a cancer and those adipocytes are playing a role in that cancer i think like that i don't know mm -hmm. and it also could be like what's in the adipocyte i mean maybe they don't have the perfect blend of you know because diet is a really big thing um diet is a big driver of cardio metabolic diseases um and i know that in mice it is really difficult to develop a mouse model of like cardio basically uh like the equivalent of human clogged arteries and stuff i think it's not just a straightforward high fat diet so that could be a reason why you don't see that but it could also be that one of the reviewers had that question and that's why they asked them to do that functional lectin per perfusion study to say, like, are those vessels functional? Are they clogged? Are they, you know, what's going on with the vessels? So, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Well, thank you, guys. Anybody else have questions? You guys did great. I love this paper. Yeah. Um, so one of the – two things I just wanted to tell you, just as a – like a teachery kind of lesson <laughs> – um, you notice in this, in this whole paper, they have a ton of histology, right? Yes. Like slides, they, they're looking at tumors, they're looking at fat, they're staining for things. And so a big reason why this project was a very successful high impact project is because they spent a lot of time observing their tissues, right? Yes. They didn't necessarily just go in and like run PCR on something that they couldn't even see. They looked at these tissues and you can see, you know, like in some of the figures, they actually physically drew little lines and said, here's where the adipocytes are. Here's where they aren't. And they looked at the relationship with, with how the tissue was organized and with their endpoints that they were able to quantify. And the second part of what my little lesson is, is number one, the first part is observe, always look at your tissues, right? And don't be afraid to think outside the box, like Maybe there's not a defined assay for what it is you're trying to do, but just look at your tissues and look at what's different between your groups. And then always quantify your data, right? Like you can't just show a slide with a picture of staining and be like, here it is kind of in this region and here it isn't kind of in this other region. Like you really do have to come up with ways to assign a numerical value to your observations. Even if it's your own brand new creation, if you can quantify your data, then you can run stats, then you can say it's significant. And all of that. So those are just like things that I felt like they did a really good job of doing in this paper. Um, and then the last thing that I always love to do and people in my lab do is what you're looking at right here. And that is physically drawing a picture of your working model. And it can be something that is at the end of your paper, right? Or it could be like your graphical abstract. You've seen those. But developing the ability to pictorially represent your hypothesis and what you think is going on is a really, really good skill and reviewers love it. Um, I always put pictures on my specific games page of my grants, even just like a little tiny picture of what I think is going on. And so just, I mean, if you don't already do it, if your PIs aren't already teaching you to do it, it's a really good exercise to be able to like draw pictures and kind of show how you think things are involved and where you want to because it helps you decide where do I want to intervene? Because like now I can go, okay, well, what if I block macrophages or what if I, you know, block fibroblasts or whatever? Because you can kind of see the way everything fits together. So that's why I chose this paper. And, you know, as pathology students, there's a lot of histology and pathology in here, but also, you know, just thinking about the complexity of how um, the obese environment influences breast cancer specifically. So you guys did, that was great. I don't have anything else to say. Thank you. Good job, you guys. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, let me know if you have any questions. And I guess that's it, right? We're done? <laughs> yes. I don't know what to, I mean, it's like, I've never done this particular format before. So anything else y'all want to discuss? Well, have a great week, rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Great Thank job. You. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.